Okay, today is August the 6th, 2019, and we'll prepare ourselves this evening in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in preserving us, protecting us, providing for us, showing us more grace than we can ever exploit. We thank you for your word and the ability that you have graciously given to understand the whole realm of doctrine. All we need is a desire, a commitment to do it, to learn it. We're so thankful for your word and what you have revealed to us as well. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate on the message this evening. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought I'd start out tonight by giving you some thoughts on what has happened over this past weekend. All of you, I'm sure, have seen news reports about the... uh, shootings that took place in El Paso and up in Ohio. And, of course, you can expect all the things that happen every time something like this occurs. Um, They try to, the first thing they want to do is try to solve it through, through the government. To a large degree, the government is the problem. To a large degree, but not the largest degree. The largest degree is that Christians have not grown in the word. They are confused for the most part. Their families are broken, just as, just as much as those who are not Christians, as much as unbelievers. And this country, for the most part, has turned their back on God. That is the primary reason. There are others as well, and we suspect that those who are pushing a political agenda, half of the country which appears to have lost their mind, of course are going to exploit what happened. And the first thing they want to do is to trot out more gun control laws. This isn't even tenable in the sense that even they know that Passing a law is going to do nothing to those who are breaking the law. Do they really think that a one of these mass shooters <clears throat> are going to be motivated to carry out their evil deed, and yet they say, oh yeah, I, I forgot um, that I can't buy a gun legally, so I guess I won't be able to do it. Do they think that they're going to abide by the laws, by the very fact they're criminals? They will not. They have to know that. And that's disturbing because every time you see genocide throughout history, in every single time, every incident, or every time this happens, there's a common denominator, and that is that the government had taken the guns away from the people. 100% of the time. And it makes you wonder if maybe that might have something to do with this. Of course, they posture themselves and they act like they're really trying to help, but they're not going to help at all. And the idea that you're going to take guns away, take them, they, they call them take them off the street, is totally ludicrous as well. There's, the estimate is somewhere between 320 and 350 million guns in the United States. And they're going to take them off the street? That, again, is totally ludicrous. And then the next thing you know is they are blaming our president. Of course, they, they blame him because if the, for anything, that's not even remotely related to him, and yet they're doing that. And this is, uh, this is really pathetic that they would take 
a time like this and decide to use it in a political way against our president that had nothing whatsoever to do with this. Uh, they, they did not in any way blame our previous president or the one before him or the one before him. They never blamed the president before, but now there's such hatred towards him that it is, it is trotted out and they are blaming him. Every time something like this happens, our freedoms go more and more in jeopardy because there are people out there that have agendas. But I listened to something that uh, someone had a actual pragmatic type of solution. It was a guy, I don't even remember where I saw it on TV, but he was he wrote a book about this, and the name of his book was called The Deficit Dad. Deficit Dads. In other words, the fact that one out of four, and in some cases even three out of four dads are missing in the average home in America. And, of course, people people don't think that's any big deal, but it actually is. You know, there's been a lot of talk about empowering women, women's rights and the like that you've heard for a long time now. That's been going on. But there has been one segment of our society that has been ignored and marginalized and forgotten. And that is our boys. It's shocking to think what has happened to boys when the father is not there. Mothers are usually more in the nurturing facet of rearing children and fathers more setting parameters. And when there is no father there to emulate, when there is no father there to hold them accountable, there is no role model for these boys that they're going to seek it somewhere else. When a father is there, they have a model to follow. And many times when the father is, is at home, the boys will get into Boy Scouts or sports or something that the father can help them with in a unique way. And he can help the, his son and mold him into being a man. Apart from that, they get their misinformation from just about anywhere. And there is nothing in the world to a boy like praise from his dad. And when they don't get that, they will find it somewhere else. And when they don't get the attention they crave from a dad that is training him how to be a man, then they'll get it from gangs. They'll get it from any way that they can. And that's what's been going on in our country for decades and decades. Just to show you how horrible the boys have been ignored and marginalized. I have a few statistics for you here. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 20 million boys, that's more than one in four, live without a father in the home. And in, in, the, in the blacks, that's three out of four have no father. Because when the government stepped in and started giving checks on the condition that you cannot have a father at home and you can't have a job, then what do you think increased? 27 out of 28 of the latest mass shooters have been male. It was only one woman and she was attached. She was her husband or some male. She was along with him. Boys are six times more likely to commit suicide than girls. Their life expectancy is lower than girls. Their IQ is lower. Even their sperm count is lower than they have been in the past. They're more likely to drop out of school 
And I could go on and on with statistics like this. And they have been ignored. And that's the thing. They are lonesome. They're lonely. They don't know where they are uh, because they hadn't had a role model at home. And so, so many of them don't have a father figure to care for them, to train them, to guide them, to mentor them. And they have time to spend, and they spend it on the Internet with these gruesome video games that desensitize them. Just uh, They spend hours upon hours on these games, and they have some kind of either a, a gun-looking thing or a joystick or something, and they're clicking this all the time, blowing people's heads off. And they don't get the praise, they don't get the attention and then they go to drugs they see they're not giving you statistics on how many of these mass shooters have been on drugs it's it's nearly all of them all these things come together they they have they're coming up with an idea that um it's called the red flag uh gun measure i don't know if you've heard of it or not I read an article about it, oh, about a month or so ago. And any time the government has a cure and it has anything to do with guns, I am very nervous about that to begin with. The idea is that when people see someone that is mentally unstable, of course it's talking about males because that's who the mass shooters are. Uh, whatever it is that is is that the males have, I know they have testosterone and adrenaline and they're aggressive and all these things. It doesn't happen with girls. But when someone sees uh, usually a, a male, whether he's probably in his teens or early 20s or whatever it is, with this red flag thing, they can call and say, oh, so-and-so over here is looking like he's mentally unstable. And so they send in the authorities, I don't know whether the police, FBI, or who, but they come in and take his guns. But only for a temporary time, they say. I think it's three months, maybe something like that. And at the end of three months, then they would go and uh, have a, another evaluation to see where he is then. And the, the article that I read said that you could call in anonymously and say, you're, you're, you're afraid that this person is a danger to himself or to others. That seems like a, a hole wide, wide enough to put a, a semi-truck through of how the abuse could, could happen then. Uh, now that's what I remember from the article about a month ago. And any time the government would start a policy like this, it's like a camel sticking its nose under the tent. You know what's next. The camel's inside. So the, the solution to a large degree, and they are even saying this on the mainstream media news, they're saying government cannot fix this. One reason I say government is to a large degree responsible because when they started taxing to a degree that the middle class could no longer uh, pay their bills and the taxes with one person working, the women started going to work. And that left the children at home by themselves or in daycare. And then you had the, the feminist movement along about the same time made women feel like, well, if you are just a housewife, then you're not even, you don't even register on the radar. You're, you're a nobody. All these things have come together. Plus, they have also said on the news that the faith-based organizations, churches, have let them down, have let people down. That if you can't face it, you can't solve it with the government and, and what, what? Why would anyone ever turn to the government to solve a problem? They are the problem. 
But then you have the churches. Where are they today? Obviously, they're not reaching the people because the most of the families in this country are dysfunctional. The very fact that anywhere from a fourth to half of the fathers are not even at home. They're not even there. How many are fathers that are there that don't care about their children? They hate their job. They hate their wife. They hate their kids. It's not even talking about how many fathers that are a bad influence on their sons. The family is the basic building unit of society. And it has broken down. And I'm not talking about just those that are unbelieving, unbelievers. Some, in fact, sometimes unbelievers have better family structure than believers have. But the churches have failed. They've gone along with the political correctness in a large, to a large degree. Whenever you have homosexuals, open homosexuals in pulpits, you have women claiming that they are pastor teachers. And everyone goes along with it. Those are just symptoms of a greater problem. And the greatest problem is that people don't look to God for answers anymore. They don't look to Him for solutions. They've been going to government for so long, they, don't, they, they act like there's nothing else to, to go to. And the ignorance is abysmal. So we, we, I don't know what the solution is as far as changing this thing. I don't think it's going to change for the better. I think it's going to change for the worse. Until the people, the population of this country have a different direction in mind. That they're no longer relying on government, but they're actually humbling themselves before God. And they're going to Him for solutions. And they get serious about learning God's Word. How many Bible churches are in the United States? I don't know how many there is, but per, I'd say probably percentage-wise it might be 5%. And that might be high of how many Bible churches there are. They call themselves Bible churches. How many of those actually teach the Bible? I was on vacation in, in Colorado, and I talked to two guys I was with to, let's go to church. It's Sunday. Let's go to church. Well, where do you want to go? Well, we looked in the yellow book. Here's the Bible church right there. We'll go to it. <laughs> I've learned firsthand that all Bible churches are not Bible churches. They're not Bible teaching churches. Everybody was standing up, waving their hands, and I think they were about to go speak in tongues. And we were the only three that weren't standing and doing gyrations and we all looked at each other and went like this and we hightailed it out of there. And that was a Bible church, or at least in name anyway. We all need to pray for our country. And one way we can pray for our country is that people will recognize that God is the solution, the one that they've turned their back on, the one that they mock. You know, there's the, the left, I don't know what you call them, the left, the liberals, or whatever, are at war against God, the Bible, and Christians. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. If you haven't, I don't know where you've been. And I suspect it will get worse before it gets better. And we're facing an election year, and if the party that is known for turning their back on God, openly so, if they win, only God can save us. In fact, only God can save us now, and people don't understand it. They don't know it. So we pray for all the families that have been broken because of this tragedy. And we pray for our nation that it will wake up and start humbling themselves before God. And we pray for our president. He's far from perfect. But it appears that he's trying to take us in the right direction. And he needs prayer. He needs prayer 
for sure that God will protect him and guide him. It's not about politics. This is, this is one thing that is good. You know, God always has things that come good out of these things. And one of them is that people are realizing what we've tried in the past doesn't work. And I think that a lot of the people who have heard the beating of the drum for gun control when these things have happened, I think they're getting tired of it as well. So we can pray that God will reach these people and can use us in doing so. If we, if we, if you get a chance, whether it's your family or strangers or acquaintances, whoever it may be, and it comes around to these type of things, we don't want to get into any political discourse with them. We just want to go right, right for the, the truth and the heart of the matter, and that is, this is not a social problem. It's not a, it's not a government problem. It's a spiritual problem. Until people humble, humble themselves, things are going to get worse. I mean, much worse. So, that's my thoughts on that. I haven't spoke about it till now, so. Only if you have a mic. Pardon? Is it, have you have it turned on? Okay. Another thing, today, there was a man who had been a Boy Scout for years ago, and, and he brought a lost lawsuit against the Boy Scouts, and he had 300 and some odd, around 350, at, over the last uh, uh, decades that have come forward and say how they were abused in the Scouts mm -hmm. deal. And he's bringing a lawsuit, and he says we need to burn it down. Or don't try to reform it. Or we need to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. And so they've compromised now, letting the girls come into the Boy Scouts. And I believe he's kind of right on that. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> See, I'm glad you brought that up. That's another thing I was going to comment. There used to be organizations, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts being one of them, and they had other organizations. And the school has all the sports activities. And everybody, at least all the guys that I knew, were involved somewhere. They were either in scouts or they were in sports. They were in the band. They were, some, they were doing something. And now, because of the perversion of the homosexuals, is tainted every aspect of our society, even Boy Scouts. And shame on them for these leaders not just putting their foot down and saying, this is... This is a, an evil that we will not abide. They didn't do it. And now, and see, oh, that's gone now. It might as well be gone. I wouldn't, there's no way I'd let my son get into the Boy Scouts now. I would not honor their, uh, perversion by having my son into there. But these are, these were supports that used to be there. But all these supports, all these things that used to be, uh, young men would be involved in are gone. And when the father is gone, this is what, what, what you can expect. Now, I know that there are, uh, some, some people may get offended and say, well, are you saying because I was divorced or my husband left me and I'm doing the best I can with my children that, that I can't, that I'm doing a horrible job? No, I'm sure all the, uh, families out there where the father is gone, the mother's doing the best she can. And some got, uh, sometimes, in, in a lot of places maybe, they're doing exemplary jobs. But they cannot be a father. And their sons are going to suffer to some degree because of it, no matter how good a job they do. And that doesn't mean that the children don't turn out well, but it means they have a harder time of it, for sure. So we're going we're gonna to get on with our uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Um, I had a surprise this evening. Uh, this computer doesn't have any, what I'm looking at right here is like a blackboard with nothing on it. And the only way I can see is to see what you see. So that's, I'm going to try to make this work and we'll see what happens. Let's see. Oh, I forgot to press this. What do I do with it? Hmm. I put my tissue down, and it completely covered this. 
That's what I was looking for. That's why on this little space right up here, I can lose anything because that's the way, you know, I just throw it down and I'm looking all over, I can't find it. Never mind. Okay, so you want to see what I see right now because I'm looking from over here. We're going to go to the notes first. And we're on lesson 153. Nope, we're on 154, aren't we? 155, okay. Help me find the blue when it gets on there. That's 154. We're on 155? Okay. I didn't hear any of that. I'm looking at numbers. Uh, 155, okay, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, here we are. All right. Um, what I'm going to try is to try one more time. Remember, we ended last time and I was, gave you some music, Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, how beautiful it was, and now, and then I was going to contra uh, contrast that with some rock music, rock band, and with some rap. Now, the reason I was doing this is to show you there is a stark difference between things that are lovely, that have symmetry, that have beauty, they harmonize with those things that are not. And it's not only, I started in the music, but all you could hear was what my computer, uh, what my computer, uh, no, uh, what are these, uh, speakers were. But I have another speaker here now. Let's see if I have it on. Yeah, it's on. And this will pump it up some. What? Huh? I'm waiting to see the glass off. What? You want me to shut off? Shut off what? I've got enough. I've got enough of that. Do you want to copy this? Well, I've got to take this and copy it copy, and then I've got to minimize this, I'm going to go over here, see you're watching what I do normally, but I don't let you see it, and I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to paste that into it, paste, okay, and then I'm going to hit enter, Okay, that's it. And I'm going to hit enter. Here we go. It's going to come up. This has a video with it. I can sh show you this video. I can't show you the other one. It's too, uh, too graphic. Full screen. This is an ad. Skip ad. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm getting any 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 sound at all now. I know this is on. Let me get over here. Let me, uh, yeah, I'm going to look at it here. I see it. I'm doing it here. Huh. <laughs> well, the music goes along with that. <laughs> oh boy I thought I had it for sure uh, well let's see if I take the... I don't hear anything at all I think I'm going to scrap this computer just look at that long enough and it's it, 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 you don't even need the music you know that 
Well, that's, that, yeah, that's complete confusion there. Well, this is not working, so I'll just kill it. And I, I don't know, I, I have something is askew. I'm sorry for wasting all this time, but look at this thing here. Can y'all see that? Let me just bring it up where it's bigger. Yeah. Is he going to show it? I guess not. Oh, this is an ad. Well, I'm sorry. This no, nothing is working. Um, so we'll just get out. Okay. No, there's nothing on my computer, and there's no sound outside of that. We're doing great. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I still have. I can still see it here as well. So. Um, Anyway, I was going to tell you hard rack and the rack. You saw that some. Um, what has happened to the soul of our people who buy this kind of toxic noise? It would appear that in order to enjoy this kind of twisted racket, one soul must be twisted as well. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but if you get enjoyment out of hearing nails being scratched on the blackboard, that's kind of what it sounds like then something is not right. Like music, lovely art has symmetry and balance as well. Did I show you these things? I did? No, no, no. This is art. This is something else I was going to show you. Yeah, this is, this is good art that has symmetry and it's, it's lovely. That's the whole point. It's huh? We didn't get there last time. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you some Winberg paintings. Are y'all y'all familiar with Winberg? Okay. Paste. Okay. Now this is a video, but I'm I'm just going to uh, click on different places of art that he has done. Here's one. You see if this is. There you go. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, let's see. Here's there's another one. There's one. There's another one. Pete, you remember that, that kind of car? Is that a Model T or Model A or? There's some buffalo. See the wolves over here. See, all these have symmetry. They're pleasing to the eyes. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? I think there's one more of the here's a house. Here's some deer. I mean, the, God created with beauty and symmetry, pleasing to the eye. These things are lovely. He's not lovely. But he is in, he is symmetrical. Okay, so I'm going to Go back here, leave that there, and then I'm going to go here. And here's some modern art. Oh, I got to go too. You know what? I've, I've got to do something here. Are y'all okay? Uh, I feel like y'all are getting restless, but I'm trying to make something work here. Okay. <laughs> okay, we need to go to modern art. 
I've just got some modern art show you as, as opposed to uh, what we saw in Winburg. These are just some I got off the internet here. Now this one isn't really all that bad, but it's 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 noisy to me. I mean, it's it's not calming to me. Uh, I don't. I guess that's. I'm not sure what that is, but it doesn't say much to me. That's that's art there. <laughs> I have no idea, but it's uh, not pleasing to the eye. Uh, I'm not sure what that is, but it's uh, yeah. And this is—I guess this is tongue. I don't know what that is, but got steps going up here. Looks like a na nightmare to me. This probably costs about. Forty thousand dollars. It looks like after I paint it out in the barn. Does that do anything for y'all? Well, I guess that's not too bad. It just reminds me when my extension card gets all in a bundle. <laughs> it must. Okay, um, let me get out of here. Let me get out of here. And I'll go back over here. So that was compared to uh, uh, modern art and so forth. Uh, this is a great YouTube, and I'm going to show it to you next time. It's by Prager University, and it shows what art, beautiful art is, and what happened to modern art, and it tells you all about it. It lasts four or five minutes. I was looking forward to showing it to you, but that has to be another time. So, I guess I can get rid of this now. This part. Okay. I don't know why I'm looking here. The downward trend is what is... In, in what is lovely could be shown in many other areas such as fashion or the fashion, the women's fashions especially. They wear work boots. A beautiful woman wearing work boots, climb around in work boots. And some of them wear a, a man's suit. And then they have, all, you know, I, I'm not one to speak on fashion, but I'm, I, I think I can tell when it's weird. Uh, poetry, literature, photography, architecture. Remember the older buildings? They really had some depth to them. They had gargoyles out there and spirals and all these things. Now, for the most part, these buildings look like big boxes. Hardly, there's no hardly any beauty to them. It's all functional, I guess. I'm not sure. Because of this trend, it will be all the more wonderful when we get to heaven and see the beauty that takes our breath away. Okay, that was all. That's how I ended up with my grand finale on, on, uh, lovely, loveliness. And if I, my computer would have cooperated, it would have been a better finale. Whatever things are of good report. Now, good report is euphemos, E-U-P-H-E-M-O-S. It's the adjective, nominative, plural, neuter. It means something that is praiseworthy, commendable, admirable, pleasing. EU, the first, the prefix here is, means good and feme means report. So it is a good report. We need to spend more time thinking about things that are commendable, pleasing, and good. So many people today go around angry and bitter because they think about people and the things that they don't like. Some of these people are known to have something called Trump derangement syndrome. Have you heard of that before? And I would use this if it was, no matter what political party it was, 
It's just something that they have put a label to, and it's indicative what, of, of the hate. They hate our president so intently, they are constantly angry, in a bad mood, and have a scowl on their face. And that's no way to live, but they are like that. Do you all know or seen evidence of this? Believers should focus on the positive and constructive rather than the negative and the depressing. And you can decide what you're going to think about. Why focus on the negative and those that bring you down? Dwelling on the negatives and disheartening things can depress us and demoralize us. I know that there's some people that won't even watch the news, won't even watch TV or whatever, and that's fine. Is there their prerogative not to watch these things. But one reason they don't want to do it is because they don't want to see that what is negative or depressing. And I'm not condemning that at all. I am different than that because I can, can wade through what is depressing and so forth because I want to find out what the other people are thinking. I want to know what their strategy is, what their tactics, tactics are, what their vocabulary is. Because if I have an opportunity to engage some of these people someday, I want to know where they're coming from. And so uh, I'm able to watch the news as, as depressing as it can be sometimes and not get depressed because I'm just after information. I want to know uh, what the uh, counterculture is doing. People become discouraged because they think about things that bring them down. If we catch ourselves doing this, we need to change our focus on the wonderful promises God has given to us. So we're, we have a whole verse here that's saying, meditate on these things. And these are, we, we've taken them one by one of what they are. But if you, if you can't think of one of those things, you can always think about the promises of God and that should lift you up out of the doldrums. That's why they're there. That's why they're so powerful. They have the power to lift you up. Even in desperate times, they can lift you up. They give you hope. They give you courage. They give you confidence. They give you security. They give you all the things that you want. They're there. And they're not going to do anybody any good if they don't know that they're there and use them. So if we can catch ourselves doing this, we need to change our focus on the wonderful promises of God. Here's a few of them here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That is a promise. How can you read that? How can you understand that and not be lifted out of whatever doldrum you may be in? That's one of the purposes for it. We have to have hope, confidence. We can't see, hear, no even entered in our mind the things that God has prepared for what? Those who love him. Can you love God and be ignorant of Bible doctrine? No, you cannot. That's why the knowledge is so important. Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you. See, those who love him, those who fear him. Which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. So again, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of men. What does it mean, trusting you in the presence of men? It means that you're not afraid to talk about Jesus Christ in a group. You're not afraid to take on whatever slings and arrows there may have come at you because you're not afraid to tell people that your God is the living God, the one that is the God of the Bible. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. Whatever you say, you say it. And this is a promise. How great is your goodness which you have laid up for those who fear you. In other words, you don't get the reward necessarily right then, 
But he's laying it up for you. You can anticipate that. You can look forward to the things that he has laid up for those who trust him and who fear him. One way we can stay positive and refuse to get down in the doldrums is only to say uplifting things about other people. Here's an old maxim that is so very helpful in staying upbeat. If you can't say something good about someone, don't say anything at all. You know, sometimes way back in the recesses of your mind and in your life, you go through and you, people come into your life and then they leave. There was an old plumber. I was 18 and he was probably in his 70s. Still working. His name was Ben Roth. He was a short, short guy and he was an old timer. And he was rough as a cop. But I grew to love that old man. And, and this is, this is one of the sayings he, he told me. And I saw him use this more than one time. He was, oh, he was a rough cop, but he would show me, uh, he was, he wanted to train me to show me how to solder a copper pipe, a joint. And the way he would talk, boy, get away, solder that joint over there. I didn't know how to solder a joint. I said, okay, and I got the torch over there, and I, I was trying to put it down. No, 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 get out of the way, get out of the way. And then he started going, come on, come on over here. And I saw it, see, that's the way he was. But he was so wise, and I, I respected him. And people would try to get him into uh, a conversation they would be gossiping about somebody, usually it was the boss, and the boss was the SOB and all these things. Ben, what do you say? And he said, well, he said, my mama taught me that if you can't say anything good about a person, don't say anything at all. So I don't think I'm going to say anything about that person. I, and it, it, boy, was that powerful. He wasn't trying to be better than that. He's just saying this is the way he is. This is what worked for him. And he was not going to engage. So this, this saying here has a particular meaning for me because I saw him use it on more than one occasion. I saw him on another occasion. Uh, the bricklayers went on strike. That means we all went on strike as well. If you're a union job. And we were off for two weeks and lost that pay. And when when we got back to work, the, the bricklayers, right before work, were all standing around talking about all these uh, things they were doing, how much fun they had while they were gone and so forth. And I saw Ben started getting his blood up. Remember, he's a little small guy. And he went right in the middle of all of these bricklayers, and he took a, one of those uh, uh, concrete blocks, set it up right in the middle of them, got on that block and started chewing them out. He said, you all will be ashamed of yourselves. So you're over here bragging about what all you did while you were off on strike, and it cost us. This is fa food off of our tan of fam for our family because of what you're doing. I can't remember what all he said, but they, there was a lot of pipe fitters there, and they were some burly big old guys. When he was through, they didn't say a word to him. He didn't cuss them. He didn't do anything like that. And that's character. To be able to do that and have that attitude. He was quite a man. I still believe, uh, uh, remember him. Now there are believers who have done something horrible or had something horrible happen to them at some point in their life and they never get over it. They remain sour, bitter, and unpleasant to be around because they won't let it go and they are miserable. I hope you're not one of those people. Maybe you have been in the past. I hope you never will be because they bring everyone down. And we're talking about meditating on a good report, things that are uplifting. And there's a lot of people out there that they are miserable because something has penetrated that they won't let go. No matter what sin we have committed, we are to acknowledge it to God. 1 John 1, 9 and then forget it and move on. If we have done it, sometimes we're harder on ourselves than anybody else. If we have done it, we are to forget it and then move on. Put it behind us. And here's a verse. Now I want you all to go to Philippians 3, 
12, we're in Philippians 4, 8 right now. Turn back a few pages. We went over this before, but it's, it's very relevant for this right here. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Of course, it's on the board, but the reason I'm having you go there is because I have some notations you might want to put on that verse. That is Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. And we're talking about forgetting it and moving on. And this is Paul speaking, writing to the Philippians, Philippians 3.12. He says, not that I have already obtained it. What is he talking about? The it is maximum super grace. In other words, he had not reached the point where there was no longer anywhere to grow. He was not at the place spiritually he wanted to be yet. So even the great apostle Paul says, not that I have already obtained it, in his mind he had not, or have already become perfect. The word perfect there means complete. And you might see up on the board here, I have that's a verb, and those letters, R-P-I there, stands for a perfect passive indicative. The perfect, perfect tense means, because he had not yet attained it, the results of that go on and on, it's a passive voice. He hasn't become, but he hasn't received that completeness yet. Indicative mood is the mood of reality, meaning that's where he was at this point, and he recognized it. But look what I have up in red next. But I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. In other words, Christ had laid hold of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. He got his attention. He got a hold of Paul then. And now Paul is saying, I'm going to press on. I, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not going to get in the doldrums. I'm not going to let it bring me down. I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep going for the call, high calling of God. I'm going to go for the gold ring. I want crowns. I want rewards and decorations. He's going to press on. And all of that may hold, lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus, verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. Notice the yet. He wasn't where he wanted to be yet, but he had the power and the volition, the will, in order to press on. He was going there. He's not looking back. And there was times that Paul failed. In a big way, Paul failed a few times. He's not letting that bring him down. But one thing I do, where is my, I'm pointing with my finger, where is my, my thing? Here? Oh, here it is. Okay. I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it, yet one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. What is it that you did or that someone else did to you that you're finding hard to let go of? What does he say to do? Forget it. Forget what's behind. It doesn't matter. And reaching forward to what lies ahead. That's what matters. Look again here. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He pressed on. And I say, see Psalm 103.12. Psalm 103.12 says that after you have acknowledged a sin to God the Father, that it is removed as far as the east is from the west. It is obliterated. It's gone. Why would you go back there and deal with it? It's like you had these old stinky old overalls on. You've been in the pig pen and you smell like pigs. And when you acknowledge your sin to God, it's like you have a crisp, clean, nice-smelling clothes on. Why would you want to get back into that hog pit? Because the sin is obliterated. Now here's the problem right here. The problem is those who won't let go of something negative that happened, whether they caused it or someone else caused it, the problem is they won't let go of something negative that happened 
constantly think about no one but themselves. Have you ever thought about whenever something is eating on you and you can't think about anybody else, it's just me, 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 and I, I'm, I'm so uh, hurt because of this and I'm so offended and I'm so, uh, uh, just, I won't let it go. You're constantly thinking about yourself and you're never going to have contentment or happiness as long as you're thinking about yourself. So they think about no one else but themselves. Their life becomes just one big pity party. They are full of gloom and doom and they themselves become their own worst enemy. If they would forget about the past, they could start thinking about other people and that would change everything. Because whenever you're dwelling on yourself and what could have happened and you're, you just go on and on and mulling it over and over again, you're thinking about yourself. And, and when you start, when you let it go and forget about it and go on and start thinking about every, uh, about other people, everything changes. And why are we talking about this? Because we are to think about and meditate on things that are of a good report, things that are good, things that are uplifting. There are some people that are, they're entrapped. It's like they're caught. Remember that, that uh, guy in that spider web looking thing with the rock music? That's what they're like. They're just tangled up there. They're just uh, gyrating around trying to get out of it. And all they have to do is acknowledge a sin that they had committed, if that's it, or if it's a sin someone else has committed, still they, they haven't put it behind them. If they would obey the following verses, they would make tremendous progress towards becoming a positive person. That's what we're thinking about. Think about things that are uplifting, things that are positive, and things that have happened in the past. Forget it. Move on. Put them behind you. And then you're, you'll be able to obey these verses. Here's a couple of them. And I'm, then we're, we're just about out. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. This is in the, in the Philippians that we studied. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. If you are doing that, you are not concentrating on something that happened to you. It is gone. You forget about it. Now you're moving on. You're thinking about other people. And you're considering their problems more important than yours. Do not merely look out your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Then we have Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. When you're doing that, you're giving the other person your thoughts and your focus, and you're not dwelling on things in the past. Okay, this would be a good time to, to, to close. Paul describes the last two areas to meditate on by an if clause. Both of these clauses appeal to something that is positive in believers. This is not something that is only a potential in the believer. And here we have the if. See, up to this point, it's telling you if anything is true, if anything is lovely, if anything is of a good report. That was the, the, the statue of it. But now it's changing. It says if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate upon these things. And that's where we'll start next time. I apologize for the computer issues we had. And I won't go back to the music again, even though I would love to see your face when you hear in full measure that rock music and that uh, rap. I, I, the reason I was excited to do it because I, I think there's some of you that never has heard that. I mean, not up close and personal and loud like I was going to play it. So, uh, But there, my whole point was that there is a very stark, drastic contrast between that which is lovely and that which is ugly these days. And so it's not hard to choose. It's just a bit disconcerting to see how many people have chosen the twisted, the ugly, those things that are not lovely. And I think that has something to do with um, not being able to 
determine what's lovely anymore. And that might be a soul kink. I'm not sure. But anyhow, uh, let's close. Father, thank you for this time that you are encouraging us to meditate on things that are uplifting. We live in the devil's world, and indeed, it doesn't take much for us to get depressed, discouraged, melancholy, blue. But you don't want us there. And so you're giving us your revelation to us to instruct us how not to go there. That we are to think about the things that are uplifting when we think about your promises, when we think about you. How can we be discouraged or depressed? You are the God of hope, the God of promise. We're so thankful for it. So we pray that you'll help us to meditate on these things. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.